And uh, we're very fortunate to introduce our next uh, presenter, who uh, I believe just recently published a book. He'll tell you all about it. Um, but please, round of applause for Tae Hee. Uh, yeah, welcome. Thank you. Great. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about a subject which is uh, something that's very, uh, that I've been passionate about, which is uh, how do you fund your startup journey? And to start off, just a quick background about myself. I'm a co-founder of Storm Ventures. We started about 20 years ago. And at Storm, I invested in about 60 companies, including uh, uh, four IPOs, such as Mobile Iron, Marketo. But I I'm Korean, and the Koreans know me best for Come To Us. It's a mobile game company worth about two over $2 billion in Korea right now. And also, I incubated Airspace and was the founding CEO of Airspace for the first uh, two and a half years of the company. Um, but for the last three years at Storm, I've been uh, working on this book uh, called Survival of Thrival with my co-author, Bob Tinker. Uh, through this journey, my wife now calls herself as a book widow, because I'll be in the, the bedroom, but instead of talking to her, we'll be working feverishly on the computer. But the book is really about how to help entrepreneurs succeed now and uh, anticipate what's next. So it's really about helping entrepreneurs in their enterprise startup journey. And as we were working on this book, what we realized is, is that uh, the book was tough because we were trying to reconcile Bob and my perspective. Bob was a founder CEO of Mobile Iron. He was also one of the early employees of Airspace. You know, I've been a VC board member. And as we were reconciling it, what we realized is that even though we worked together for 15 years, it was like watching two different movies. And this picture actually illustrates sort of the two different views. Bob, as uh, the founder CEO, he's like your typical surfer. His number one goal is not to wipe out. You know, he's not trying to look over the next wave, look at everything. He's just trying not to wipe out, and he's in the water. And so Bob refers himself as the punchline guy, just wanting practical advice to solve today's problem now. Now, me as the VC, I'm like above the water and clean. So that's uh, the benefit I have. So, you know, I'm in this helicopter above the water and not just looking at one CEO, but like, you know, the 10 to 15 companies I work with. So you get to sort of see what's going on and, and sort of trying to help anticipate what's next. So the book really became a reconciliation of our two views of the, the startup journey. But the question that I want to talk to you about today, because I think if I were you as an entrepreneur of an early stage company, what I'd be asking a VC is, oops, is how does understanding the startup <coughs> journey impact my financing decision of whether I go to VC, whether I go to angel, corporate, you know, in the plethora of funding environments, you know, what is that going to lead me to? And I think the best answer, to understand the answer, you have to understand the implications on your future startup journey. So right now, you know, for every entrepreneur, you're in a fortunate time. You know, it's not like 2002, it's not like 2008. 2002, three was the worst time when we had like spouses of LPs attend our LP meeting because uh, the, the other person had, uh, couldn't explain why they were making capital calls to VCs. So you, you're in a very good time where everyone's feeling good, Mark is doing well, and so as a result, there's a huge amount of startup funding opportunities, as you can see by the amount of angel funding, you know, SoftBank just raising a $100 billion fund, and there are rumors they're gonna raise another $100 billion fund, and uh, with the amount that's coming funding, not just from VCs, but others. So given that, you know, one question that obviously comes up that you want to ask a venture capitalist, and you can ask me questions along this, what, uh, the whole speech here, so anytime, is, is venture capital the right step for you? And so I'll give you the first answer is from a venture capital standpoint, and that is, what do venture capitalists want to invest in? Because obviously if they're not interested in you, then they're probably not a good match for you is that venture capitalists really, in the early stage, just want two things. To just, if you just boil it down, what they want to do is they want to invest in a high growth company. That's what everyone is striving to do, is to invest in a high growth company. And I'll talk more about what high actually means. 
because that has different meanings to different people. But what is you know, high growth? And, and second is to get a board seat to basically drive high growth and then the ultimate exit. You hear about a lot of other things, but really at the end of the day, if a VC can do those two things, then the VC generates returns, part of successful companies, VCs make their careers, they're part of unicorns, whatever, life is great. So you can hear about a lot of other things, but it really just comes down to those two things. And if that's something that you're willing and able to do, then VCs are right for you. And if you're not willing or wanting to do that, then it's probably going to have some sort of mismatch and conflict over time. So that's what, uh, from a venture capital perspective, of what VCs are looking for from startups. Now, if I were to flip this around and say, OK, if you ask me the question, if I were an entrepreneur today, not a VC, but an entrepreneur today, and I know that there are multiple financing choices, like I can go from corporate, I can go from angels, you know, I can go from VCs, whatever. If I had those choices, the question that comes up that people ask me is like, how would I raise money in that case? And my response is actually, your funding source does not matter. So whether it's VC, angel, corporate, thinking about it that way, in my mind, if I were you, is like irrelevant. Instead, I would just ask and pick investors that will help you find go-to-market fit. So in a sense, you know, think of investors or VCs not as the end goal, but what you need to get you to your destination as part of the startup journey. And so what I'd like to spend some time on explaining is why is go-to-market fit so important for financing and so important as part of your startup journey, especially since this term go-to-market fit is actually something that people don't re readily talk about as well too versus like product market fit. And so the first question is what do you mean by go-to-market fit? So go-to-market fit we find is that it's the missing link to unlock growth. It's the intersection of when you have your product and technology with your go-to-market strategy and when that's working that intersection is what we call go-to-market fit. That what that does is it unlocks growth, whereas product market fit would be your product and technology with your market so you have some happy customers, all that, but it doesn't unlock growth. So this intersection of finding growth market fit, what it does is it unlocks growth. And what you'll see next through a series of slides is that go-to-market fit, in addition to unlocking growth, has a profound impact of unlocking capital in this whole financing market right now. And so this is uh, the typical chart that, you know, when I meet with founders of companies and work with founders, how a founder typically perceive of creating value. This is a typical response. In other words, you start a company from left, you start with the founders, hire a great team, you know, start building a product, that's the founding stage of the customer uh, company. You get some customers to get product market fit, and then you're trying to unlock growth. But during this whole time, the founder perspective is you're creating value. You know, you hired great engineers, that's what I hear. You hired this like great VP of sales. You know, so the founder perspective is you're creating value that you know, you've closed your first customer, creating value. And so the y-axis is about valuation and fundraising ease. What I mean by that is that as you're hitting these milestones, the perception is the value of the company is going up and it's easier to raise money. In fact, reality actually looks like this. What I mean by that is, is that this time when you have product market fit, instead there is a huge gap between what the founders believe in terms of value and fundraising ease in terms of reality. And so what happens at that time is, is that it turns out to be, in my experience, the most highly stressed time within the company journey. It's that time after you have some customers, so you have product market fit, but you have not unlocked growth. That time is when 
what happens is, is that uh, internally you have this plan to go exponential growth, but reality is you're adding just a few customers. So as a result, you have missed expectations. You have a high degree of frustration. You're wondering if you have the right people, the right strategy, the right skill set. And most importantly, you're running out of time and money. Because now you have a full engineering team. You know, it's not like the honeymoon phase where you just build a product and people will come. You're sort of, it is, in my experience, the most stressful time for the company. And so what you need is, is that product market fit is not what's required to unlock growth. Product market fit is not what's going to get you your next round of financing um, in a company. Instead, the reality is, is that you need to have this unlock growth, which will unlock capital. And the surprising thing as we were writing the book and working with our companies, realizing there is no name for this that you need to achieve. And so that's why we came up with the name go to market fit, because like when I'm working with our companies or talking to others and sort of talking about hitting a milestone, if there's no name for it, it's sort of hard to describe what the, the milestone is. So that's what we named it as, as go to market fit, because at the end of the day, um, that is the key milestone to unlocking growth. And actually, valuation, surprisingly, is not even flat. It's actually going to go down. It's actually going to be harder to raise money when you have some customers than you did right at the beginning in most cases. The reason is, is that your burn rate is higher. So, and there are some data points that people have that you have customers, but you have an unlocked growth. Whereas before, you can sell vision. You're no longer able to sell vision at that stage. So it turns out that valuation and fundraising ease is not flat. It's actually down. And so that's why this time period where you have some customers but have not unlocked growth is like the hardest time to raise money and to be in a company at that stage. So what go-to-market fit does is that it delivers predictable, repeatable, scalable growth. It allows investors to run a spreadsheet model of you. And, and so that you can say, if I added X dollars, then I'll get Y growth. So it's this idea of predictable, repeatable, scalable growth. And it raises this question of, strategic question of how much how fast to grow. Because go-to-market fit by itself doesn't mean you're high growth. It just means you have predictable, repeatable, scalable growth. And so the key question that's going to come up for every company at this stage is, you know, how fast do you want to grow versus how capital efficient you want to be? That once you have go-to-market fit and you have that predictable, repeatable, scalable growth, this is like the fundamental strategic question that you as a CEO or founders and the board will have to work on. And the answer I tell people is high growth is not always the answer. Instead, the answer is you want to be on this curve. You want to be on that optimal curve between growth rate and capital efficiency. And the worst place to be is like right here where you're really not high growth as what the high growth companies are pursuing a high burn strategy, but you're high burn. So if you're there, you're definitely viewed and will have a very hard time getting funded. Whereas if you're one of a company here, which I'll talk about in the next few slides, you can pursue a unicorn high growth, high burn strategy like I did with Marketo or Mobile Iron and it can work well. or if you're a low growth company but capital efficient, you can do very well, but it just takes time. And so I exited a company after 16 years and, you know, but didn't raise that much money and the founders and everyone did well, including us. So I want to talk about what is high growth because every founder CEO I've, in our portfolio, if they're growing, says they're high growth. You know, whether they're growing 20%, 100%, 500%, they all tell me they're a high growth company, okay? 
And in a way, that's true. You know, if you're like an analog semiconductor company and growing 20%, that is considered high growth in the industry and all that. But from an investor standpoint, when you go out, what is high growth? The best example really is uh, this blog post that Nirish did from Battery, and he talks about triple, triple, double, double, double. What it really means is that if you're below 20 million ARR, you should be at least tripling. If you're above 20 million, then doubling. And the way he came up with this chart is that uh, he plotted companies like Marketo. Neeraj and I were on the board of Marketo together. He looked at uh, you know, Omniture, Zendesk, Salesforce, others, Workday, and came up with this. And so what do these high growth companies have in common just from a financial standpoint? Is that below 20 million, they're tripling. Above 20 million, they're doubling. So that's high growth. To put it in perspective, I'll share with you like an excerpt of an email that another VC sent to me, which is, what is he looking for? He's looking for companies that have all about momentum. What is momentum? That if you're crossing two to three million ARR, he wants it, he's looking for companies that will go from two to three to eight to 10. If you're a 10 to $20 million company, then 100%. So this is like a triple, and this is like a double. So going back to that Pareto curve, it's important to know, especially if you're a, a B2B software company, which are most likely the ones you know, that are gonna be using AWS and most of the companies like we invest in, that high growth in this context is you know, below 20 million, you're tripling. It doesn't mean if you're not that you're a bad company. In fact, as I said, we have made a lot of money from ones growing slower, it's just that you need to have a different burn profile in, in that case. So then the question is, okay, we have go-to-market fit, and I just want to complete the rest of the startup journey just quickly so you can put this in context. Because I said, financing, to understand financing, you have to understand how it applies to your startup journey, uh, because it's, it's a means to an end. Financing itself is not the end. It's just strictly the means to the end. So once you have go-to-market fit, the next stage of companies is, is to accelerate to category leadership. What that means in particular for Valley companies is, is that every space, once it becomes hot, will be called a category. Because that's generally how customers like to think about it. It's like categories, and it's like investors like to think of in categories. And then within a category, there's usually a winner, and it's a winner-take-all world. And so the question that everyone asks is, are you gonna be the category leader? And if you're perceived as the category leader, right here, if you're recognized as a category leader, you can raise money at a higher valuation, it allows you to hire great employees, that allows you to invest more aggressively, so that you can actually get customers faster than your competition, so that reinforces your position as a category leader, and you create this nice virtuous cycle that allows you to raise like 200, 500 million dollars over time very fast. And you're separating from the pack and you become the category leader. And, and so that's why we describe that once you find go-to-market fit, you want to accelerate to this category leader, and then after that, the challenge becomes how do you escape your category and transcend your category and sort of become a leader of multiple categories, the in sustainable industry leader. But that's sort of the, the next phase uh, of the company journey. And, and so at the end, it looks like uh, this, and this is what we describe in the first book, which is uh, uh, explaining the, the company journey to you. So, now that we understand in general sort of how, why achieving go-to-market fit is so important and that when you're raising money at the early stage, you know, all you really want to do is to get to go-to-market fit, how does that sort of more specifically apply to you or to me if I were an entrepreneur? And, and so it's like, how should finding go-to-market fit influence my funding strategy, if that, I'm saying, is my goal at this stage of the company? Is that you really, there are three things that come up, is you really want to raise enough money to find go-to-market fit, because you don't want to be stuck, you know, 
just before finding it. The worst, like a development or in other things, like if you're 80 percent done. As a developer, you might feel you have 20 percent to go, but from the outside, they don't know if you're 80 percent there, 90 percent, or only 10 percent there. So as a result, uh, you want to raise enough money to find go-to-market fit. You want to pick investors who can help you find go-to-market fit because that is the key milestone. And as I said, it doesn't matter whether it's angels, VCs, or strategics, because a strategic partnership could be the key to your go-to-market fit. And then lastly, um, you know, usually with fundraising comes board members, and so you want to pick board members who can help you guide you on your startup journey. So the first one about advice one is raise enough money to find go-to-market fit. Because the worst thing for a company is to just run out of money just before you find go-to-market fit in your oasis. This is a really disappointing situation, but it happens more frequently than you think. But this is like, in a sense, as a founder, as you know, your early investor or anything, like the most frustrating period is when you have a situation that really feels like this. So the thing to be aware of and careful of is beware of disappearing funding oasis, that oasis disappears due to market conditions or due to sector rotation. You know, all these factors, when people say, you know, you just achieve this and we can get money and all that, all those things can sort of, interim oasis can happen, but they can disappear like this if the market changes. Or if people say, we're just not interested in that sector anymore, or everyone's in, already now invested in that sector. So what you'll find is that in the early stages of the company, that the only permanent funding oasis that you know is there, regardless of whether it's 2002 kind of meltdown or 2007 financial crisis, is if you find go-to-market fit. If you find go-to-market fit, you will always be able to find investors for the company. If you don't, it doesn't mean it won't be there, but it, then you're dependent on a lot of other situations. The other thing I, I would, uh, advice that I give you know, to entrepreneurs and if I were doing it myself is when you're raising money at this stage, early stage, you want to avoid one-shot investors. And that is you know, because you might be just like 90% there before your next funding oasis and you just need that little bit more money. And so there may be some VCs, some other investors that can provide emergency water, and that's typically referred to as like an inside round. So it's nice if you have that ability. It's like having an emergency gas tank that you can call uh, of an inside round. It's, and inside rounds tend to be the hardest things to like push through our partnership and others is to have that ability for an inside round. What makes inside rounds really hard is if you have investors that are free riders. So if you have an investor, if you have a syndicate of like three VCs, two want to continue with an inside round and one doesn't, then you have a free rider problem. And what that happens is that the inside round doesn't get done. Uh, we refer to it as like a broken syndicate at that point. And so inside rounds usually require everyone to do their pro rata because you know, it means everyone's like sharing the burden together. That's one. So there's like a fairness element to it. Second is that if the inside round, if everyone doesn't participate, it sends a message to ev the partnership that there's got to be something wrong, more fundamentally wrong with the company than what uh, the, the VC board member is saying. Because uh, in, in a VC partnership, um, there's the VC who's actually on the board or sponsoring the deal, and at that point, the rest of the partnership just views that person as like drank the Kool-Aid and is biased and always wants to continue funding, and so there is this sort of check and balance. So having someone that becomes a free rider creates immense pressure when you're trying to do an inside round. 
And the other thing that happens is that you want to avoid investors that leave a mark because uh, I if you have a VC firm that's invested uh, in one round but doesn't invest in the future round, it, it just sends a signal there's something wrong. I mean, like I, I was on a call with a, a major corporate customer that was thinking about buying a, a product or a company I'm on the board of, and he says, well, there's this major VC firm on your cap table who didn't invest in the last round, so can you explain why and what's wrong with the company? So I was amazed that it has an impact not just on future investors, but on customers as well, too. Uh, the more well-known the VC, the bigger the problem becomes, because then it just means there's a taint on you and there's something wrong. The second advice really, you know, as I mentioned, the first advice, as I said, is, you know, raise enough money to get you to go to market fit. And by the way, once you have go to market fit, who you have as investors become irrelevant <laughs> because you can stand on your own because you have unlocked growth and you're growing as an independent company. So, you know, once you've found, hit go to market fit, unlock growth, you have independent control and like you can raise money from whoever, however, and all that. So you have independence and who your investors are doesn't matter. Until that point, you, you have all this vulnerability. And so the next thing that would do is really pick investors who can find go-to-market fit. Because until you have that, you're really in this sort of very highly vulnerable zone of investors that may not do inside rounds or you may not achieve go-to-market fit, that kind of stuff. And, and so I want to talk to you about how to find go-to-market fit. So the first thing about finding go-to-market fit is to explain what it's not. And what it's not is that it's not relationship selling. Uh, um, I'm Korean. I guess Korea just won uh, the game, which was a shocker to all the Koreans against Germany. But I was in Korea last week and was talking to Koreans about how to find go-to-market fit. And the answer that I hear from Koreans and Asians in general is that the way you go to market is through relationship selling. Well, go-to-market fit generally does not come from relationship selling because relationship selling is not repeatable and scalable. The other is, is that you know, having a he founder hero selling is great too, but that's also not repeatable and scalable. You just cannot build a go-to-market team of trying to hire superstar salespeople that are as good as the founders. It just doesn't work. It doesn't mean that you don't have that in the beginning, but it, it's just not repeatable and scalable. So what you want is, instead of relationship selling, one is a way in such as, you know, customers find you. So if you have a good content marketing strategy, inbound marketing, and others, what you have is ways in which customers can find you. And, and that's something that's repeatable and scalable. Um, the other is, is that instead of founder hero selling, is to build kind of this growth machine that you can hire just normal people but deliver great results. So the, these are sort of, just sort of conceptual things. So I'll talk more specifically on how we suggest doing it but we found to be effective. Um, because go-to-market fit is so important for early stage companies, because as I said, that's the demarcation line between where we generally make money and lose money, we've really focused a lot internally for us on how to do it, whether through the book or leveraging our 130 enterprise investments, because through that we have reach of customers, and just investing in go-to-market investments because go-to-market itself is going through a lot of change right now, and then sharing that knowledge with uh, consulting firms and others. Um, and what we really are trying to do is become this thought leader in go-to-market. You know, we wrote the book, but now we're providing sample go-to-market playbooks. We held an event and have videos available, speaking, and, and intensively applying it with, to our companies and through that, we're hoping that, you know, making it available to others as well, too. So a as we're learning and applying it, we're also iterating, and now we're like on a, a fifth version of like a go-to-market fit canvas that we're hoping to get prepared that make it freely distributable to everyone. So the way we look at how you find go-to-market fit 
is really when you need to do is have these three elements. The first element is you have to line up with an urgent wave, which answers one simple question, why should a customer buy now? Not six months from now, 12 months from now, but buy now. In other words, there's an urgent pain. And if that urgent pain leads to a larger trend, a lar then you have an opportunity to become a unicorn. The urgent pain allows you to get in. Riding the wave allows you to become a category leader. Second is, is that you need a go-to-market model which matches how a buyer decides to buy. It's not how you want to sell. It's not what the investors tell you to use. It's how a customer decides to buy. And we'll talk a bit more about that. And then lastly, you need a go-to-market playbook, which is about how to find and win same customers re repeatedly. And the key element of that is sort of finding the wow. Because if you can match the urgent pain to the wow, you have something that is the core of this engine that works. So let's talk a bit more about, the urge, about this urgent pain of buying now. So in terms of finding urgency, this is something that we suggest working while the company is in product, trying to find product market fit. So what this chart is, is a bit of a complicated chart, is, is that uh, on the left, you have the target customer and the target pain point and saying that's the founding idea. In other words, every founder that I know that started the company, quit a well-paying job, you know, doing this, is because they have this idea of what they believe the customers want to solve a, a particular pain point. So we call that the founding idea of a target pain point for a target customer. Most of the time, in fact, I can't think of a company that funded recently that that founding idea became the first urgent pain. The urgent pain is usually something adjacent to it. Like in Mobile Iron's case, the founding idea was to manage and secure smartphones at that time, which is Blackberry and Symbian. And the urgent pain became the new iPhone that emerged that wasn't part of the original plan. So looking for adjacencies around the founding idea turns out to be the key to identifying this urgent pain. But it turns out it's harder to do than it seems because to the founders, it sounds like heresy. You know, I had one company that failed because the founders were so focused on this founding idea. And everyone says, you know, as a startup, you should focus, right? You can't do 100 things, so focus. Focus on the founding idea, because that's why they quit their very well-paid jobs and took a 50% pay cut and so forth, because they really believed in the founding idea. Um, so that's all they wanted to focus on, but the, the sweet spot, the urgent pain was adjacent, not in it, and as a result, the company could not they found some customers through founder selling, but it could not unlock growth. And so that was not a good exit for us. So it turns out that being open-minded to being around the founding idea is critical, but as I said, it means it's overcoming this heresy. Because what's gonna happen is that as you test around it, you'll get some data points. And if one of them starts taking off, that will be your urgent pain. The next thing uh, about this uh, um, pick your go-to-market model is what we talk about is that there are three general types of models which can be sales-led, marketing-led, product-led, and, and we have examples in the book and others about Mobile Iron, Marketo, and SendGrid as examples of different kinds of go-to-market models. And the point that we want to make though is that the model you pick should be the model that really dis matches how the customer decides. Right now, product-led models uh, are something that we as investors love because those companies spend about 25% of their revenues on sales and marketing versus a sales-led which will spend 50 to 60% of their revenues on sales and marketing. So who wouldn't want you know, 25% versus 60%? So they're much in vogue, but it turns out that for this to work, what you need is you need the buyer, the user, 
and a champion basically to be the same person and to know exactly what he or she wants. So if it's like email as a service, voice as a service, or we have Algolia, search as a service, you know, people know exactly what they're looking for, they can compare, analyze, and it works real well. If you have a committee of people that needs to decide, um, self-serve or product-led does not work very well. Instead, you, know, you have to help the customer form that, get the committee to form a consensus to buy. That person that helps the customer form that consensus is usually a salesperson. And so if you have buyer decisions which are based on committees, it tends to be over here. So it's important to pick a model that, as I said, matches how a, a, a customer decides to buy. And then lastly, and I want to spend a bit more time here, is on this uh, go-to-market playbook. Um, the, the first thing is, is that uh, uh, the playbook is not a 30-page document. It's, uh, it's a one, to maybe two-page document at most. The second thing is, is that the playbook is not for CEOs or executives or for board members. It's for the new sales rep or the new marketing person that you're going to hire. So it's something that you want to give to that person, and so that person knows exactly what he or she needs to do to be effective and to achieve on the go-to-market. And so what we found that works really well is um, the following process in building the playbook. The first is, is that to lay out the customer journey, and these are examples whether sales-led, marketing-led, or product-led, but lay out the customer journey as different steps along the way. So we gave this example here. And it needs to represent the physics of the customer journey. What I mean by that is, is that it's not the Salesforce forecasting method of, you know, is a prospect a lead or, you know, an opportunity. That's great. That's great for modeling. But, you know, it doesn't help people in terms of exactly what to do. It should actually represent the physics of the customer journey and that everyone must have the same view. The second thing is that once you have that journey, you can see what people do and say at each stage. And then from that, identify the wows. The wows are something that uh, uh, it's not decided by founders or the product team, but it's based on the customer reaction. So it's when you say something or show something where the customer, you can tell, really becomes interested. You know, they want to learn more. They lean in. In fact, um, this identifying the wow, I would say, has become the focus of like several, about a couple of companies of mine right now. And what they're doing now is sending two people, one that's pitching, and the other to just observe the customer to see when the customer body language changes and so forth. And they're really leaning in. Because once you know that, you can see what is getting that customer excited. It's what co converts a skeptic into a champion. The wow tends not to be the most technical thing or the most complex thing, but it's what the customer wants then, especially if that matches the urgent pain. You have something that will work. Um, but coming up with that is much harder than it seems. And as I said, it, it's, um, when you find it, it's very powerful. Once we have all that worked out, then you can see, say what the rest of the company can do to support the playbook. And example of that is that once you know what the wow is, then you can have your product team focus on that. You can have your market team marketing that and sort of really leveraging what gets that customer excited. And then lastly, because it's all tied to these physical stages, once you have this data, and everyone is like executing on the same playbook, what you have is you get all the metrics. You know, what you get out of that now is metrics. You can see what your conversion rate is, what your time is, and you can see what is causing the problem. Is it going from your first meeting, your second meeting? You know, the first meeting could be the demo, the second meeting could be setting up the trial, but you can find out what is holding you up. 
because it's now based on sort of physical events along the, the, the customer journey. Um, what we provide is like here's a sample of the Mobile Iron Playbook, and as you can see, there's uh, uh, identifying what is the wipe, I mean the wow. It turns out at that time in Mobile Iron's history, the wow was not the policy engine, it was not the fact that they could provide all this security, it wasn't that. The wow was simply they could wipe personal f corporate data from someone's personal iPhone without l wiping the employee's photos or con personal contacts. It was that selective wipe, which is what customers really wanted at that time. And it turned out actually to be one of the simplest features for the company to build. So the engineers were shocked that that was what they wanted. Um, but by showing it, it immediately provided the wow and accelerated the sales cycle. So going back, what we found is that you know, go-to-market fit is really, as I said, when you have all of these three things, so you've lined up with an urgent wave, so you have this urgent pain, you've picked a model which uh, uh, matches how a customer decides to buy, and then you have this one to two page playbook that then new employees and existing employees can all follow, leveraging uh, the wow. And that when you have that, the question that comes up is, what does it really feel like? And it's important to get the feel is that what it feels like is, is that there's a wave pushing you. That without go-to-market fit, it feels like you're paddling a surfboard. You have to do all this hard work. It's this like, you know, heroic founder selling. Once you have it, you, can, you feel like you're riding a wave. More importantly, as an investor, you can see it externally. You can see lead and pipeline growth, deals predict predictably, deals close predictably. You, this is a, a key point, is that for every additional dollar that we spend on sales and marketing, we can predict what uh, additional billings the company will generate. And, and new reps quickly learn to win, and most importantly, the company knows what to do. So when you have that, the company has really unlocked growth, and it reaches a point that every investor then will want to invest. You know, you, you will have an easy time getting investors um, at that point. The third advice I want to talk about as you're deciding what investors to take right now is uh, about board members. Because usually when you raise money at this stage, you know, your investor will also want to be a board member. I mean, if you're raising money from a bunch of investors with no one joining the board, that's fine too. But uh, uh, in most cases, you know, your lead investor will want to get on the board. As a side note, if you're doing a round where no one wants to get on the board and you're raising money from a group of investors, that's great. Um, it's unlikely that they will do an inside round for you. Because if no one's that invested to join your board and so forth, it's more likely that these are all one-shot investors. So if you want to do that kind of round, which is a, can be a very effective round, we call them like a party round, you just want to make sure you raise enough money to get to go to market. You just don't want to be stuck just before. So the last topic I want to talk about is uh, uh, you know, how to pick board members that can help you guide you on the startup journey. So the first thing, really, when you pick a board member is to really understand the implications, is that you're really picking a boss. You know, it, it's, it's a big change. It's one thing to just have an investor, but to have uh, an investor who's a board member is, is quite different. And uh, it, it had a big impact on me because before being a VC, I, I was a partner in a law firm. And as a partner in a law firm, you know, I was at Wilson Sonsini and Venture Law Group. There, I, I would work closely with founders. And with founder CEOs, I felt like I was there um, like a, a personal doctor, you know? I would hear about 
these ideas, you know, I, I would hear about these issues, that issues. I felt, I come from a family of doctors, so, you know, it felt like I was their personal doctor. And, uh, uh, and many of these clients became good friends of mine. And I remember one in particular that we were, you know, close to. Uh, then we started Storm Ventures. He started a company. We invested in his company. And here's a person that's a good friend of mine. I've known him for a long time. I had an interaction with him as a corporate attorney. And uh, uh, as soon as we closed around, you know, I got like 90% less information than I did before. And it was highly filtered. And, and at first it was a surprise and I felt like, what is going on? This is like the same person, you know, we have this like history, all this kind of stuff. And what I realized is that, you know, as a 20% owner of the company and a board member, it's a different relationship than being a corporate attorney that the CEO can fire anytime. And, and so the first thing to keep in mind is uh, uh, when you're picking an investor, regardless of the investor and they're joining the board, you are picking a boss. And challenges of picking a boss usually comes up with in these three cases. So the three major sources of conflict between a CEO and the board usually resolve around, revolve around the next round of financing and exit or obviously you want to change the CEO. So those tend to be the three major tension points between the CEO and their investor board member. Um, in terms of the next round, the, the big challenge is, is that, uh, uh, and, and frustration amongst founder CEOs is that you will see the investor board member sort of act flipping between fear and greed. On the fear side, the feeling is, you know, they don't want to invest any more in the company. Uh, the greer side, greed side is when they want to do more than their pro rata or maybe do the whole round. It's like the same investor, same investor board member, same company, and the person could be flipping back and forth. The, the best way to decide how to flip is, is, is that um, it's because of the fact that it depends on whether they pass the, the market test or not. So maybe I should just do a quick time check. How much time do I have left? Oh, I'm over? Okay. So, you know, I'm going to skip this section. Uh, because it's really about uh, uh, advice on um, CEOs and, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so what I just want to end with here is, is that, uh, you know, the fundraising advice I have for, you know, everyone here in the room is, as you're thinking about whether you want VCs, angels, whatever, is really, Think of that as just a means to an end. And what you really want is at, at this stage of the company, your goal, number one goal should be to get go to market fit. And so you want investors so you can raise enough money to get to go to market fit because 90% there is not the same as 100%. You want to get to uh, go to market fit. The second is, is that you want to pick investors who can help you find go to market fit. And then lastly, um, I, I'm happy to talk to you about individually later on if you wish, is to pick board members who can actually guide you through this startup journey. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and you'll be around for a little bit for questions? Uh, later on. Excellent.